Okay, welcome back everybody from the coffee break. Hope you had a good break there because we're gonna head now into a very political discussion. Now, as the commissioner mentioned in his keynote, the big policy focus here in the Netherlands and in the EU more ge in general is decarbonization and the so-called energy transition. And so what this first panel is gonna talk about is how LPG and gas in general has a role in that energy transition. The need for low carbon fuels such as LPG and natural gas is being recognized in policy, but what is its place exactly? So for this panel, you are in very good hands with my colleague Sonia Van Rensen. She is also an energy and climate journalist in Brussels, based in Brussels, uh, and she has a very distinguished panel to talk about this issue, which I will introduce now. So we have Joe Kang, president of the International Gas Union, Bram Graber, CEO of SHV Energy, that's a decentralized ener energy solutions uh, provider. Joy Alafia, President and CEO of Western Propane Gas Association, based in California. And Stephen Haywood, Vice President of Edelman Amsterdam. And finally, Sunil Matur from the Indian Oil Corporation. So, Sonia, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dave, and it's uh, a pleasure to, to be here in Amsterdam with all of you today. So we're going to take, uh, as Dave said, the next hour and a half to talk about LPG and, and gas in the context of the energy transition. There's some big topics we're going to try and get into. Uh, one of them uh, is, of course, the role of, of gas and LPG in an energy transition that's very much these days about uh, decarbonization about, in Europe, reaching carbon neutrality by 2050, about the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, and also how these fuels fit uh, in the context of an increasingly, we can say, emotional backlash against fossil fuels. Um, we're going to talk about innovation within the fuel itself, bio-LPG, renewable LPG. Uh, is this something that's realistic? Uh, how much, by when, can we make of that? and also innovation in terms of the kinds of sectors uh, LPG could be deployed in, uh, innovation in terms of logistics. And finally, we're going to look at some of the, talk about some of the potential synergies between LPG, LNG, and natural gas, and why not renewable and zero carbon gases such as hydrogen, which is also uh, attracting a lot, of, uh, a lot of attention, certainly in, in Brussels and in Europe today. So to kick us off, we've got five uh, great speakers. They're all going to take just a couple of minutes to tell us what energy transition means to them, because it's fine decarbonization, but it's also energy access, security of supply. It's about health and development. Uh, and what they think the energy transition means for LPG and gas from their uh, respective viewpoints. And then we'll go into questions, and we'll take time, of course, for your questions and, and comments as well once we get going. So first of all, I'd like to, to hand over to Bram uh, Graber. As you heard, he's here as a CEO of uh, SHV Energy, uh, which is the world's biggest LPG distributor. Uh, he previously worked for Royal Boscalis, um, one of the world's leading players in dredging and marine services, uh, and spent most of his, or long part of his career before then, working for KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. So over to you on yeah. energy transition and what it means. Thank you, uh, Sonia. Uh, by the way, uh, introducing uh, my view on energy transition does not mean I consider myself a bigger expert than you in the room, but then we have to deal with whatever is in the room. And if you listen well around you and even to the introduction at the grand opening, there seems to be an elephant in the room of the LPG world. And although breakfast was a while ago and lunch is far away, let's, let's take a, a culinary view on that. Because the big question is always how to eat an elephant. We cannot just ignore the elephant in the room. Uh, and what I have learned uh, over time is eating an elephant is uh, by small bites. Uh, some people, if you read the newspaper today or you look what's happening in New York, they think you cut it in three uh, and no further ado, or you put a plug in it, electrify it, and it's done. I think it's more nuanced and more complex than that. And I think one first way to segment the discussion is that there's, for me, at least three layers of discussion of uh, energy transition. And these layers have their own rules of the game. And I think we should, at least I consider for my company, that you should be careful what is your latitude, what is your influence on the different levels. The first one is at the highest abstraction level. That's a discussion in society and in politics that sets the overall uh, uh, scenery. 
Let's not forget that the rules in that particular discussion are not the same as our rules. One of their rules is how to win the next election. That, that's a variable that is totally different from running a business. So it also means for me that whatever is happening in that discussion is, is relevant, but is not something you should immediately panic about. So if, if somebody here on stage says, let's phase out uh, in two decades all kinds of fossil, then that's an opinion, that's a view, it's not necessarily uh, going to happen, and also not a reason, reason to generically immediately put in the newspaper, no, it's not true, it has to be different. So one, we have a very relevant, let's say, public and regulatory environment that we are not, uh, uh, not part of, but we should be careful that we're not always there try to uh, correct whatever people are, uh, are exclaiming uh, there and, and claiming there. Then the second level is the level of industry. I think that's the level of the people in this room, where in the end of the day, when you talk about energy transition, the real technologies, the real solutions will be invested in, will be developed and will be applied. In the end, some entrepreneurs in this room will stand up and say, this is the way to move forward, this is where I put my money, and this is where the solutions of the future will come from. Partly from the current LPG applications, partly from maybe more renewable LPG sources. And then, let's not forget the third and most important level, I, I think I should have started with that level, that's our customers. And our customers, in the end, uh, they also read the newspaper, they also look at the other two levels, but in the end, for them, it's a quite pragmatic thing. They have an installed base, and they have an affordability. And whether they are a, a driver of a small Renault in Paris, a lady uh, that in the end put on her yellow vest because she was really uh, tilted over by the increasing carbon taxes coming in in the French context. Uh, that's how the yellow vest movement in France started half a year or uh, a year ago. It was very simplistic. Uh, the first layer uh, running over the last layer in terms of affordability. So between us and our customer, we have to sort out where we fit in with affordable and practical solutions. Not only the current solutions, there will be also things we have to invest in. At least my company is also willing to do that. But I think the end we should never forget is we work for the third layer. That's where the money comes from. And we should also stay in their context and their uh, realism. So that's at least one uh, hint for, uh, uh, for eating. Yes, it's a sandwich. And maybe later we come uh, uh, to discuss uh, how you eat a sandwich. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to indeed come back to how we eat that sandwich. Um, <laughs> I'd like to go on to, to Joe Kang, so indeed president of the International Gas Union, and he's hosting uh, the presidency for the, these three years, uh, up to 2021, when Korea will host the World Gas Conference. Um, and under his presidency, the, the mission of the International Gas Union is really looking to promote gas as, as a part of a sustainable global energy system going forward. Uh, he's also an advisor to the Korean Gas Corporation, COGAS, and, well, to sum up, a very lengthy and impressive uh, CV, has more than 30 years' experience both in the, the private sector, in the energy industry, and in academia uh, when it comes to energy uh, and the whole debate around that, particularly in Korea originally a development engineer, so he fits into <laughs> more than one uh, of the levels that, that Bram just told us about. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Shona. Good morning, everyone. And it's a great pleasure to discuss uh, this uh, issue, which is the center and the front page of a global agenda, energy transition. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago in Abu Dhabi, in the World Energy Council, this topic is a major point of discussion and the many views on the opportunities and the challenges were highlighted. To me, it is very interesting to hear that the efforts of many Middle East countries currently heavily depending on the oil production and the consumption export present their ideas, views, how to diversify their energy in that region. But my observation and the single takeaway from the Congress was there is no easy about the upcoming energy transition. And that there is no silver bullet that meet the ever-increasing energy consumption as being non-carbon neutral intensively. To this end, ladies and gentlemen, Innovation and the technology will need significantly step up and supported by industry and the government as we need some major breakthroughs if we are serious about significant reduction 
energy-related emissions. Even there is a debate about the rate of transition and how we compare previous shift. I think one thing is evident is how to deny the concept of itself never before garnered so much public attention, attention from the all corners of the world, across the popular media and the communication platforms, and the featured prominently on the many government agendas. And even though sometimes attention is not always positive toward our industry, we do not feel it is a bad thing. It is simply become more important that industry step up its own communication and the engagement and the one of the reason why I welcome this invitation to be with you. Now, I realize that there are different views about the natural gas and the propane. I've been seeing both end of argument we are the competitor, also we are partners. And I agree with that in certain country and the segment, we are the one or the other or both. However, what we cannot deny that natural gas and the propane are both carbon-based fuels. I might say the cleanest carbon-based fuels, there is sometimes we cannot, we can rely on and support each other through. I see our relationship as an opportunity, and I will explain why. It is a good thing because I, it allows us to advocate the good ideas, like a great funding for the innovation technology deployment and to be heard. It's time to transformation, transform perception of our industry and to show that we are the modern, innovative, nimble, can also play in the clean tech space. We are industry that the strongly values of sustainability, recognize the critical importance of technology, innovation to the sustainable energy future. We are central taking on the energy trilemma head on. Even though my focus today is a discussion is on the role natural gas should play in this effort. LPG value is implicit in that as well. The value of LPG provides as a great conduit of transforming from highly polluted fuels to the natural gas. I guess Korea is a showcase. While infrastructure and the application for the latter are process of developing. Ladies and gentlemen, I firmly believe that the natural gas is the most economic and the direct route for the sustainable energy future. Not merely as a bridge, but as a vital long-term economic and the environmental contributor. There are a large difference in the energy needs, opportunity around the world. For example, load of gas in the European North America market is very different from that in the Asian and the African region. In mature markets of a developed world, gas offers a quick win. It provides tangible, immediate pass cut emission by increasing utilization of extensive existing natural gas infrastructure, switching away from the harbor heavier hydrocarbon like coal. Even natural gas offers the ability to store very large amount of energy, very low co cost. When you look to the developing world, the picture is entirely different. The average of a coal plant in the South Asia is uh, less than 15 years, while 40 years in Europe. In other words, it has a new and rapidly growing fleet of uh, coal power plants. At the same time, the penetration of uh, natural gas in this area is very low compared to the global average. And infrastructure investments are needed to take advantage of opportunity gas offers. Opportunity for the fueling this region's economic development uh, while cleaning up the air, air and the cutting emissions to meet the Paris uh, commitment and the limit the global temperature rise. Ladies and gentlemen, there is an area where no 
energy infrastructure exists, people still suffer from the severe energy poverty. This is where LPG provides great opportunity to the helping, help getting this community out of the dark and into the much needed clean cooking while infrastructure developed. This is my wrap up, waiting for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think you, you've perfectly set the scene for our, our next speaker, who's, who's here from India. So I think some of the, the points you mentioned about gas providing uh, uh, a great, a great uh, quick win, a great route to a sustainable, more sustainable energy world, and particularly when it replaces coal, but also biomass in cooking, of course. Uh, and India, as we heard in the opening remarks this morning, has a scene, I think it was called, the, the world's largest and most ambitious campaign to, to bring uh, LPG as a more sustainable fuel to uh, low-income households. Uh, Sunil uh, Mathur, he's here as executive, executive director for LPG from the Indian Oil Corporation, uh, which is a Fortune 500 company handling almost 12 million tons of LPG every year. He's originally a civil engineering and management graduate, more than 30 years experience in the downstream oil and gas business, uh, has also spent some time working with the WLPGA in Paris, uh, and one of his, um, his current responsibilities is also as chairman of the Indian Oil Petronas uh, Private Limited Company, so a joint venture between Indian Oil and Petronas of Malaysia. Over to you. Thank you, Sonia, and uh, good morning to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. The Indian LPG market is slightly a mix of what Bram said and what Joe said. I mean, we have the haves and the have-nots. 60% covered by LPG, mostly in the urban areas. Almost 35% having no access to LPG. And what Joe said of uh, natural gas being a quick fix solution the Indian condition is slightly different. What we see as a transition fuel in LPG, we have practiced it for the last three years. A country of almost 283 million families, households. Last three years, we ended up giving LPG connections to 80 million people last three years. And the reason is very simple. It's a transition in lifestyle, it's a transition from improving the environment to a much cleaner air that the rural uh, women used to breathe in. From health perspective, lesser uh, impact on you know lung diseases, tuberculosis, and all. More importantly. If you see when I talk of 80 million households getting the connection, it's all in the name of the women, indicating an inclusive growth, a big contribution to the economy. You talk to the women, they have much more spare time to be utilized productively. So what I'm trying to indicate to the house is that we have actually seen the LPG improving the lifestyle of these masses. Critics do say this has come at the cost of uh, the exchequer in terms of government support. But then, when you talk to these people who were having no access to the cleaner fuels earlier, you actually realize that it is worth it. I mean, when you, towards the later part of the discussions, when we start comparing the, the infrastructure required for natural gas or with LPG, the time taken, the three A's that we used to talk about LPG, availability, acceptability. It's worth the effort. And uh, maybe it would have costed a billion rupee, uh, dollars, uh, $1.2 billion, but the pace of change in the last three years, 36 months, uh, 36 months, slightly less than that because we achieved the target much earlier. It has actually transformed the lives of the masses. And what better example, if you see, in terms of uh, a transition fuel 
changing their lifestyles. It is for all of us to see there. Our only effort is, as the house says, it's a transition fuel, but prolong the life cycle of this transition fuel. And when I say prolong, we have the availability in terms of 50% domestic production, 50% imports. But then efforts are on, again we'll discuss later on, as to what happens to increase the availability of LPG uh, by virtue of uh, bio LPG and all. Uh, the country is well on its way to working towards that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, we go then from India to the United States, and I'd like to welcome once again Joy Alafia, President and CEO of the Western Propane Gas Association. Um, so this is an association that promotes LPG propane um, as part of California's clean energy economy. Um, and she's, her association at the moment is very much focused on how to commercialize renewable propane. She also advises the California Energy Commission's Clean Transport Program and looks to promote protein, uh, protein, propane <laughs> in that uh, context and previously has work experience in the real estate sector and a variety of, uh, of tech companies, uh, including Intel and also the Electrical Power Research in Institute. Originally a physicist, uh, but with an MBA. Over to Great, you. thank you. Uh, so, a greetings. Well, let me do one correction. I was never a physicist, but I do have a degree in physics, so I like to uh, highlight that, that difference there. So, uh, greetings, everyone, from the United States of California. Uh, at least that's how we look at things. The world's fifth largest economy. The fashions itself is a global leader in climate change. Uh, our state has instituted a variety of uh, practices, including gas disincentives for uh, or outright gas bans on new residential construction. Uh, we're a state that has imposed a host of carbon tax programs that seeks to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, 80% below 1990, uh, 1990 greenhouse gas emissions baseline. Uh, our state, uh, much like other parts of the country, are, we're looking at internal combustion bans. So some pretty dramatic changes in terms of the energy and particularly the role of gas, both natural gas and propane in these markets. And with this as a black drop, backdrop, I'm pleased to say that propane has a role in the world's energy future. But it's not your grandfather's propane and it's not your father's technology. Our industry must innovate. And we should look at innovation in three key areas, the fuel, the technology, and our ability, ability to integrate with other sustainable energy solutions. Uh, in addition to innovation, there's a critical role in terms of educating the consumers and allowing them to serve as our industry advocates. What we're seeing in California is that when we're speaking about the benefits of our fuel, we're perceived as just being self-serving. So we really need to deepen the understanding of our customers. Uh, they really can elevate and amplify our voice and in doing so, we'll be able to tap into the national clean energy movement with an authentic propane value proposition. So let me provide a little bit of color on the areas of focus that I just mentioned. First, focusing on renewable propane. Uh, how fitting is it that we're having this discussion during the US's Clean Energy Week and also during the UN's Climate, change, uh, climate Action Summit? Climate change is viewed as a global issue, a global crisis and the public is demanding bold new action. The discussion is quickly turning into a binary debate of fossil fuels on one side and electrification on the other. But there's another part of that equation and that's the role of biofuels. As was mentioned by Dr. Kang, there is no silver bullet. We like to say it's more of a silver buckshot, um, if you will. No one energy can deliver all of the world's energy needs and they all have inherent benefits and disadvantages. As global citizens, we should have a fuel neutral policy discussion based solely on the carbon footprint. Such a fact-based fuel agnostic discussion would demonstrate how mixed fuels, including renewable propane, uh, is the only way to optimize energy decarbonization. So let me provide a few quick stats that I gleaned from ICF, if anyone's familiar with that organization. 68% of Americans believe fossil fuel companies should be required to pay a carbon tax. 
And in 2017, 85% of the Standard & Poor's top 500 companies and approximately 88% of energy companies have developed sustainability reports addressing climate change. The market is ready for sustainable energy solutions, including renewable propane. If that doesn't convince us, we simply need to view our competitors. Diesel has renewable diesel. Natural gas has renewable natural gas. The only issue I hear from these industries is that there's not enough to keep up with demand and or regulation. Even gasoline is becoming cleaner as they look at carbon sequestration. As we look at renewable, you may be asking, is renewable propane expensive? The answer is yes. But the market has proven a willingness to pay a premium for a clean fuel. Every drop of renewable propane has found a consumer. Another reason to uh, commercialize renewable propane in addition to market demand and competitive positioning is quite simple. The rules of the energy game are changing. The rules uh, for the future will simply be renewable or nothing. With energy mandates proposing the elimination of fossil fuels, our industry needs a renewable option to remain at play. And finally, there's a moral obligation to offer renewable propane. If we have an opportunity to produce a cleaner fuel in this era of climate change, we should do it. When looking towards technology and equipment, I'll briefly highlight a few opportunities rather quickly here. So let's continue to innovate uh, our emissions profile for our appliances and engines. This is part of the solution. We shouldn't wait for regulatory mandates. Rather, we should be ahead of these mandates, driving innovation, and as a result, gaining market share. We need more engines certified to the ultra low NOx 0.02 uh, grams per horse horsepower hour. We should continue our energy efficiencies for appliances such as tankless water heaters. And propane technologies with these leading lower emission advantages has translated time and time again into higher unit sales. For example, in California, we saw sales for irrigation engines displace uh, sales for um, diesel engines. Government subsidies also open up when you have such a solution, as is the case for us with the propane irrigation engines. Finally, I'd like to circle back and uh, how we reject this debate of good versus evil when looking at low carbon energy. The energy needs for the globe are great and renewable propane complements other sustainable energy solutions. For solar powered homes, we must tell the story of how propane provides backup power when battery power is low or depleted. And while you're at it, you probably wanna have a tankless water heater installed or a propane gas range. For electric vehicles, let's talk about propane power generation to charge those vehicles. And while you're at it, net electricity back to the grid when demand peaks are, are, are high. For areas struck by natural disaster, or as the case in California, when we're looking to avoid natural disaster, and we're looking at uh, utility public safety shutoffs, now's the time to have a backup propane generator, ensuring sustained power. Um, by the way, such blackouts are not only inconvenient, but they're costly for the consumer. PERC estimates that blackouts cost about $1,250 per instance, or about 1,100 euros um, for each occurrence. So let's start thinking also about microgrids and distributed power. What might that look like, and what's the role of propane there, uh, particularly in the United States where we have an aging grid infrastructure? The energy landscape is changing, and we are part of that change, but we must innovate, we must offer renewable fuel, and we must educate uh, both consumers, regulators, and legislators. So with that, I really look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. So some very clear messages, one being that there needs to be a, a renewable option going, going forward, and there needs to be integration with other sustainable energy solutions out there. Uh, I'd like to come then to Stephen Haywood, our, our final uh, panelist, Executive Vice President uh, at Edelman here in Amsterdam, Edelman, the, the global communications firm. Uh, he's an expert in reputation management, uh, so probably good to have him on board uh, <laughs> here on our side. Um, with uh, more than 15 years' experience in the energy sector specifically, also working a lot on sustainability issues. And, well, you're, you're last, but maybe feel free to comment to come back a little bit on, on things you've heard. But tell us what your work has, has taught you about the role of LPG and gas uh, in the energy uh, system going forward. Yeah. 
Thanks, Sonia. And yeah, I definitely uh, can't resist the, the temptation to respond a little bit to some of the comments already. Um, at Edelman, we've been looking into trust for over well, almost 20 years. Um, by trust, we mean the uh, attribute that you believe someone else or an organization will do the right thing. We've been looking into trust because we think it fundamentally defines the relationship that brands and organizations need to have with society. Within that research, we've been looking into the energy sector for over a decade, and there are some really fascinating findings. Um, I'm not going to go into them in too much detail today, but I think it's worth starting by saying, I think rather than eating Ram's ele elephant, I think we kind of need to make friends with it because the energy transition is here to stay. People's belief that renewables are the future is here to stay. And so as a gas sector overall, I think it's the responsibility of the sector to look at how we can embrace that um, belief, how we can respond to the challenges that it, it places on all of you, and how we can seize the opportunities that it will also create. Um, we know that people expect companies, and particularly CEOs, to step up and to address these important societal issues. We know that 75% of people across the world expect CEOs to speak on relevant issues, and almost two-thirds of people expect CEOs to speak on environmental issues and take environmental leadership. So the reality is, whenever you're not speaking about the energy transition and the important role that gas has to play in that transition, you're failing, you're failing your customers, you're failing your shareholders, and you're failing your staff. It's really important to be able to tell a story about how gas plays its role in the transition. Um, I guess another question is, how should the gas sector um, tell that story? I think, you, Joy, you mentioned storytelling, and I think it's a really important aspect. We also know that um, the company you work for is seen as a very trusted source of information. Uh, some of the drivers behind that are the erosion of trust with politicians, uh, the rise of fake news, uh, a lot of confusion about what people see on social media and what's real and what's not. And rather than getting into all the details of that, I think a takeout for everyone in this room is that means that people increasingly turn to the company they work for for information. And if you can provide that information and build that confidence with them, then you can turn them into an ambassador that can tell the story of your role in the energy transition towards their families, their neighbors, their the people in their community, the people they've touched in their professional lives, and through that be able to build more trust in this sector. Um, just another word about how gas is seen with it within the overall energy mix. Uh, I, I would describe it as riding on the coattails of clean tech. You see in almost every uh, region of the world that clean tech is uh, very trusted. In fact, the rise in trust in the clean tech sector is actually driving an overall rise in trust in energy across the world. In almost all markets, we're seeing quite large increases in energy, which sounds great, but when you drill down into that, the, the elephant emerges again because that is only driven by a belief that renewables are the future of energy. Uh, you see gas being seen as sort of the next least worst option. So not necessarily as a uh, revolutionary fuel or something that's gonna power the transition. That is a story that still has to be told, but seen as the, the next most trusted source of energy. In Europe, the story's a lot worse. Gas is not trusted. In emerging markets, typically gas is seen as a trusted source. And I think that reflects people's reality that they've made a transition from uh, more carbon intensive and more polluting fuels towards gas so they understand uh, the role it has to play. Uh, so I think there's a massive opportunity there because you have a fuel which is just bordering, and it's almost, to me, on a bit of a tipping point. Will we, in this room, be able to tell the story of gas in a way that is relevant and places its role in the future of the energy transition and kind of catch up with clean tech? Or will we stumble and fall and not rise up to the challenge and instead start to fall back into the world of oil and utilities and nuclear, which are seen as not trusted sources of fuel and not trusted um, organizations, uh, for want of a better word. And I think that's the real challenge that's facing everyone in this room and the sector overall, is whether we do um, catch up and start to tell the story of gas with more confidence and uh, in a way that uh, really connects with uh, those that care, which is really the consumers, it's the uh, the people complain, the people um, protesting, it's the shareholders, it's the employees, it's everyone you mentioned in the three tier. Uh, and I think that has to come uh, from action within this group. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So is LPG trusted or 
does it, is it renewable LPG that is trusted? <laughs> our, our research shows that uh, in Europe, it's not, it's not trusted. It's just uh, what we would call in a neutral area. So it's kind of tipping into the area of not being trusted. People okay. in general would not believe that this, this organization, again, for want of a better word, is, it will do the right thing. In emerging markets, it's trusted. Um, but it's very close to clean tech. So I think there is a, an opportunity there to connect the renewable story, the gas story, and explain its role in the energy transition. Okay. Uh, Bram, I wanted to come back to you since you, you kicked us off. Um, again, welcome to comment on some of the, these points that have been made, and maybe the, this last point about trust. What You made the very valid point that customers are ultimately are the bottom line. What feedback are you getting from them? And since you're a company, I mean, that's present in lots of markets around the world, this experience also trust is different in Europe versus emerging markets. What's your experience of the energy transition in some of these different parts of the world? Let's indeed zoom in on this, uh, this trust item. I think we have to be a little bit humble here. So we can all be very angry that we're not trusted, let's say, in the European scene. I would say the immediate priority should be that out of this generically generated mistrust at this highest level of abstraction that I mentioned, we at least make sure not very strange and awkward things are coming. I'll give you an example, I think, how to operate there. The, in Europe, LPG is mostly a fuel very relevant for the rural areas outside the cities. And 90% of the debate is about what's happening to energy in the city. So we can go there and say, hey guys, uh, listen to us. But I think focusing on that for rural areas in Europe, and that's exactly, I think, what we're trying to do, all together uh, in the European uh, scene, making sure for that particular set of customers that have other uh, energy requirements uh, and challenges than uh, the people living in the city, that at least in that area we make sure that uh, LPG, which is a, an excellent uh, current and, and partly combined with renewable LPG, even a better solution going forward, uh, still has its place. So I think we also have to distinguish between making a lot of noise and uh, look at this and we're great, etc., versus making at least sure it doesn't get out of hand. Because we have to be humble to what extent we influence the overall debate at the, at the highest level uh, in, uh, in society. That's also not at least, I think, uh, uh, our role. Then if I make uh, just a, a snapshot of two or three uh, geographies we are active in, uh, if I look at China, if I'm really uh, uh, blunt or provocative, I think in my view, in my humble view, the country that is really most practically advanced in the energy transition is China by far. Because in Europe we have uh, a lot of debate and uh, we talk a lot, especially also in the country you're now uh, visiting, it's, uh, it's amazing. But then in reality on the ground uh, it moves extremely uh, slowly. In China the, the, the top layer of the sandwich is a little bit dominant and it just says, uh, guys, uh, 10 years ago they asked us, could you please develop an LPG uh, fueling uh, infrastructure for uh, taxis in Guangzhou, so we did that. And uh, eight years later, say, oh, by the way, in two years from now, 100% of that is gone because all taxis will be electrical. Thank you very much. See you later. Then we as an entrepreneur, we will grow another segment. That's not the end of the world, but that's, that's a sort of a way an, an energy transition can also uh, 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 go. And then in a market like uh, India, but that, that, that's clear. Uh, when you uh, go on the airport, uh, in any airport in India, there's big banners where the, the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, is there and he has a cylinder in his hand and he says, we think it's important that our people move uh, uh, away from, uh, from coal, wood and what have you to uh, uh, LPG. So that's another way of uh, uh, transition and, uh, uh, and trust. And then uh, in the US, if I may, although Joy of course knows uh, far more than uh, me about uh, that market, in a state like California, the question is, do we like a mandate that might come up uh, which make it mandatory to, to have in your LPG because California might be the first one to have that on the table, to have a mandate to put uh, renewable LPG in your total LPG mix. We're not so much in favor of that because what I like about uh, having also in the portfolio a renewable LPG, you can go to specific customer groups, particular companies, particular applications, where it's here and now relevant and maybe also affordable. Well, if you make it a generic uh, uh, commodity that you must uh, put in, uh, which you do when you get a, a mandate, that's not necessarily uh, uh, helpful. So also there you see that the the direction of development is quite uh, attractive, then the way to implement it is something to keep also uh, an eye on. So I forgot, I'm, I'm not expecting that there will be a, a great day in the future that everybody says LPG is always uh, fully to be trusted, but we have to make sure we get the space to do the right thing for our customers, or keep our space. 
just one follow-up on the, the bio-LPG point you made. Can bio-LPG ever achieve the volumes, uh, the volumes we would like to see without a mandate? Now we have to become a little bit technical. Uh, Bio-LPG, in our view, not. Huh? We think of our own volume that could be, let's say, 10 years down the road, maximum uh, 18 to 20 percent of our total volume. But renewable LPG, so then we talk about other uh, pathways of production, that could be even not the, the molecule LPG, but a molecule that you can mix with LPG. There we think in the end, over time, in a few decades, you should be able to get to higher degrees of, uh, uh, of renewable LPG, but then there's a wider spectrum of solutions. And where does renewable LPG come from then exactly? What are well, the uh, 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 multiple potentially uh, uh, routes, potentially, yeah. not all of them already fully <laughs> operational. But to give you one very simplistic uh, idea, there's not so far from here, 20 kilometers, there's a big steel mill, the only steel mill in the Netherlands. The general idea is to capture all the CO2 coming out of the chimney, and I can tell you it's quite uh, a lot. And if you combine, uh, for instance, the CO2 uh, again the green hydrogen, which you might have uh, uh, generated from uh, uh, wind farms on the sea, which is 30 kilometers from here, you might be able to regenerate the same fossil molecule for a second, a third, and a fourth time. This is not something which is ready uh, tomorrow, but this can be part of the, uh, the patchwork we need to make uh, the molecule in the long run more sustainable. Okay, so basically it's uh, green hydrogen production through electrolysis and then combining that with, with carbon. So LPG is one of the fuels you could, you could make with that process. This is yeah. one route. We, should, we yeah. should, at least we think yeah. we should investigate. I can mention three other ones. The point yeah. is, uh, if we don't start investigating uh, some of these solutions, uh, even 20 years from now, we won't have the availability uh, of that product. Okay. We can obviously come back to that. I'm sure there's lots to say. But I wanted to come back to, to Joe because you, I mean, this is innovation where we're talking about. And you also <laughs> emphasized uh, the importance of, of innovation. And particularly since trust is coming from the clean tech sector, I guess that makes it all the, the more important. Um, I wouldn't say the, the gas industry has necessarily been known as, or is known as the most fast-moving, innovative industry out there. So how do you, um, yeah, how, how do you see it? How do we move forward? How does it become an agile industry? Okay, thank you, Sona, you're asking this question. And uh, there, I was hoping that uh, you're asking this question. The reason I'm saying that is uh, this is exact the perception we need to change. As I said, global energy challenge and the day-to-day -day reality that the shape of our uh, the season is really uh, the based on the uh, very based on the where you're looking into. In other words, as a reality across global is very different. Different things for the different the players, like a different medicine on the different DGs, LNG and the LPG is no exception. But the energy technology and the innovation is a one common universal thread that everyone align on and benefit from. The challenge of resolving this uh, tremendous uh, energy transition is enormous. We must accept that as uh, renewable and the natural gas is uh, take a center stage of energy transition, mixed solution is uh, required to provide uh, sufficient energy to ever-growing population and economy while improving air quality and uh, remitting climate change commitment will require new era of energy, innovation, technology, and the research. We're living in the amazing area of uh, close pollination and the uh, removal of uh, silos. I think uh, there is a great potential for the natural gas and the LPG, distributed resources, uh, digital technology, to name a few to work together then I back to the point I'm going to make, trying to make at the beginning. The opportunity, the high level of uh, public and the political attention to subject of uh, the technology development, the brings, it provides a level to the attract more money, more funding for the technology and the innovation. When both public and the investor more accepted the proposal of a technology investment, which historically have been very difficult to justify. Today, we are in the great awareness of necessity of innovation and the technology development. We are at the industry, must 
deliver a message that we are the part of a solution and we offer the technology, innovation, which perfectly fit in the clean tech space. With having said that, to keep this momentum, to tackle this uh, a tremendous energy transition, energy tri trilemma over this century, the industry, the government, and the civil society have to work together. That's the my rationale behind uh, put the, putting great emphasis on the technology and the innovation. Do you do you think the the gas sector, uh, I'm thinking gas including LPG as well, is is managing to position itself, as, as Joy put it, as a, a partner to, as a partner to other energy solutions. Uh, we heard also this morning there's a huge political push for electrification, and often gas is still set up as a, uh, the two are set up as in, being co in competition with one another. So how, how to transform that into a, a partnership narrative? What can the industry do to? Well, and you can see the, the IEA, the projection said that uh, the recent uh, 20 years, and the renewable and the natural gas are upswing, other than is a downswing. So we say, and the renewable and the natural gas is hand in hand partner because the natural gas has to provide the intermittency and the seasonality of the renewables. So if a renewable can take care of everything, and uh, everything is a bridge fuel, but uh, we have a long way to go reach the, that energy utopia. So we have to find some solution to reach that uh, utopia. So by when does gas need to be fully decarbonized? Well, and this is a really barrel of a molecular size. You study the coal and the oil and the less and the molecules. But also, the decarbonization as a low carbon society is slightly different. This is very abruptive and this is a slow processing. So I think that's uh, maybe, and uh, you never know how many and the uh, gas reserve in the earth. But I would say, and uh, thanks to the technology, it might go to the more than the 50 years from now on. Okay, so in the next 50 years? Um, at the least. At least, so it will take yeah. at least 50 years uh -huh. for gas to transition from being a fossil fuel as it is today to being fully carbon free. Yes, carbon free okay. and well, and the natural gas is not the carbon free. We have and the molecular wise the CH4, yeah. so we have a carbon there. Yeah, hence, <laughs> hence the, the need to transition. Yeah. Ultimately, if, yeah, yeah. If, if we say we, yeah. May, um, may I make a remark there, which I think is quite relevant, yeah, that in the transition, not in every country, the decarbonization has the highest priority. One of the reasons why in China and also in India, the pressure of the top layer is so strong is really air quality, and air quality not 50 years from now, but next year. So that's the second driver why natural gas and LPG together, because for there you, you are natural partners, you are the ideal, uh, both large-scale uh, electricity generation and also retail uh, solutions. And let's not forget that maybe in Europe, except maybe for Italy because of the biomass uh, disaster, uh, air quality might not be that evident, but in a number of countries that is far more urgent and powerful than the idea that in the long run decarbonization yeah. has to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, add up some yeah, comments and from and uh, okay, This is a really and the important uh, where you're looking at it. And India, they are really suffering in the energy poverty. So they need a clean cooking fuel. So they are burning in the biomass, and this is a real and uh, health issues in the India. So that's a different area and a different uh, solution. I wanted to ask uh, you, Sunil, well, one question is the decarbonization of LPG. Is that, uh, is that a topic for debate? Is that something you see as important for India or, or not at this stage? Uh, and secondly, coming back also to the, the trust issue, the, the impressive rollout you've had, to what extent, I mean, that is dependent on government subsidies, as you said, to so what extent can you maintain that, that momentum going forward? So uh, when I classified the Indian market into the haves and have-nots, the have-nots we have addressed through the government program, what Stephen said was the trust element. So when I'm attacking the new customer base, I think the trust is the most vital, this thing. I'm trying to wean away those new customers from the easily and uh, freely, I must say, available uh, biomass or firewood and all. And so I must ensure a you know, sound, robust supply chain. Otherwise, it doesn't take much time 
for these uh, customers to revert back to the uh, biomass and defeating the very purpose. So when we stepped into this activity, we did a lot of homework in terms of strengthening the supply chain, increasing the, you know, the bottling capacities, transportation. It's, it's, it's a continuous effort. But coming to the core uh, question of decarbonization, I think uh, when the Indian government announced the policy of um, a gas-based economy by 2030, the LPG industry continues to grow. And um, the fact is that today, uh, this uh, pursuance of decarbonization, whether it is through the gas-based economy or through my expansion of the LPG industry, the purpose is the same. It remains to be seen as to what happens to the you know, geographical areas that, we, that have been let out to develop the uh, natural gas uh, infrastructure. As I said earlier, in the Indian context, it's a time-consuming effort. And so, at what pace to push up this uh, ingress of LPG into this thing? The segment that I have today in the, uh, uh, this urban market, I mean, the customers are looking for decarbonization, weaning away uh, from the traditional furnace oils, HSD, to cleaner. I mean, we have uh, multiple industrial customers who have even switched from uh, natural gas to uh, LPG, courtesy the pricing scenario that happens, uh, keeps fluctuating month to month. And that is where uh, even this innovation and technology. So we continue to pursue this uh, innovation. It could be through, you know, uh, product improvement, which we have been doing, we have been increasing the calorific value through additives, uh, giving potential savings to the customers. It could be through uh, strengthening the supply chain management. I mean, today we are investing almost uh, more than uh, $1.5 billion in constructing a cross-country LPG pipeline uh, from the West Coast going into the Central India, and it's uh, supposed to be the longest LPG pipeline. So to that extent, uh, I think there's a firm belief that uh, decarbonization would be pursued in the right this thing. Uh, it's a question of, you know, as I said earlier also, how to prolong this issue of um, uh, allowing LPG to grow, whether it is through the naturally available resources or subsequently through the renewables. Okay, so, so there is emerging demand from, from customers for decarbonization, but as you say, there's uh, the first goal is to create, to build in the, the, the natural gas or LPG economy, and then decarbonization is something that um, uh, will be phased in over a, a longer time period. And the question then is to what extent can all this infrastructure that's being built up be repurposed or reused for? Absolutely, absolutely. So as I said, I'll just dwell further like bio CNG, we, we've set up plants actually in isolation mm -hmm. through the municipal waste and all, it's already feeding some customers. The next cycle is of course cellulosic uh, uh, bio LPG mm -hmm. and the work continues on uh, both these fronts and it's a matter of time as to see which course emerges better in a stronger way. Yeah. I just Joy. Yeah. Add uh, to, to, the, uh, to Sunil's point, um, in, in, in California we have some of the most expensive energy costs in the world uh, for California, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury to wait 50 years. I like to say, uh, if we don't disrupt ourselves, we will be disrupted. So we absolutely need to have renewable propane available in the next 10 years. Now, whether it's neat renewable propane in markets or whether it's some blend, whether it's a DME blend, these are the things that we as an industry should discuss and, and put forth. But uh, when you look at the competitive landscape, uh, for example, in California, the diesel market has committed to 100% renewable diesel in the transportation market by the year 2030. Uh, so we need to be able to uh, provide our own uh, self-promoted uh, mandates, if you will, uh, goals, whether it's aspirational. Uh, we need to show a commitment to clean energy, and we need to have that available relatively soon. Uh, there's also, when you're asking about the, the um, renewable propane, how is it produced, and, you know, whether you call it biopropane or renewable propane, I think these are some things that we need to work through, too, and I, I know that there's some s specific definitions in Europe. Uh, renewable propane has brand cachet in California. Bio uh, doesn't quite hit the mark, so I, I hope that we could get to a point where we could just universally call it renewable propane. 
Um, but we have kind of a sister fuel relationship, and it's not with natural gas, it's with renewable diesel. So uh, in this, the States, renewable propane is produced as a byproduct of the renewable diesel process. I'm not sure uh, what the education level is with the audience, so I'll just share that information. And the yield is relatively low. You're looking at a five, three to 5% 5 yield of renewable propane from the renewable diesel processes. Uh, so in California, we're very careful not to badmouth any gaseous fuel. We're all in the same boat. We all have our advantages. Um, and, and we uh, try to work hard to ac accentuate uh, our unique roles because we genuinely have a value proposition. Uh, and, and we don't really speak in terms of transition fuels anymore because that's also uh, we're uh, looking back. We talk about propane as a post-2030 fuel. And the way that we're able to do that is by talking about renewable propane. Uh, the way we're able to do that in California where we have wildfires, we have dead trees, uh, we talk about being able to address the dead tree issue and forest management, um, addressing that issue, and also uh, producing renewable propane. So we need to be very keen on how we sell the importance of renewable propane and that it provides real value for consumers um, today. Where and where do you see the, the biggest opportunities? So, I mean, you, you work on, uh, you advise on um, California's, what is it, clean transport yeah. program, for example. Is, is yeah. that one of the areas where you, you see the biggest potential going forward? So it's, it's a really interesting conundrum that we're in. The, the biggest uh, market, is, of course, for us is the residential market. So if we could crack that nut uh, and have enough volume for the residential market, that would be fantastic. But the conundrum is that uh, the subsidies that we receive currently is for transportation. And we don't have very many vehicles available. So we're getting subsidies for a very, we're already a niche fuel in a very niche market of that, uh, of our, our total market share. Uh, so it would be, uh, this is, I, I know it almost sounds like heresy, but we would love to see incentives for producing renewable propane, whether it's legislation or regulation, that would provide funding for um, the, the processing uh, of renewable propane in the residential market. I think that's gonna be really key uh, for how we're able to uh, provide the fuel for the largest market sector. Okay, thank you very much. Stephen, do you want to? Uh, actually, uh, I think, Joy, what you're talking about there in terms of what needs to be done in production is also the same in terms of communication because educating people about the use cases for uh, different forms of gas and how that fits into the energy transition is something I think will be really important in building that trust in the sector overall. If people understand uh, what a form of gas can do, that it can replace a different fuel, it can replace a more carbon intensive fuel, it can reduce air pollution, it can meet environmental standards. And that's how we can build more trust in the sector because people will see it and bring it to life. And I think um, that's where any communication around that will change from being something which is, yeah, maybe around cities and around kind of very uh, sort of a certain niche audience and will instead be something that has broad applicability to audiences that care about this. And I think you, you would be hard to look anywhere in the world and find um, parents who don't care about the air quality around where their children are being brought up or anywhere where people uh, don't worry about the future in some capacity. So I think it's finding a relevant energy source and a relevant story for all of those audiences. And that's how together we can make a uh, more compelling case for gas. And, and how, how do you see the energy transition changing the... I guess the, the business case of forcing a change in business model and identity even of, of LPG companies, LPG distributors. I've been at other debates and there were suggestions of, you know, we should become energy companies. We should move into power generation. Maybe we should invest in renewables. We heard this morning, um, I think the King's Commissioner said, you know, can you become a biofuel producer in future? I don't know if this is something that yeah. your work has given any thoughts on. Um, uh, not directly. I think the reason for that is those conversations can become a little inwards looking as an industry, I think. And the, the sort of the, the man and woman on the street who ultimately inform the priorities of the politicians who ultimately mandate some of these things, I don't think make such clear distinctions. Um, I think there is a very big kind of um, gap in terms of thought between um, the en energy in a kind of a conceptual term and power for homes and electricity. So I think that's something where 
consumers and stakeholders don't always th think about the energy mix in the way that people in the industry do is where I see the biggest disconnect. But um, outside of that, I think that's a little bit of a kind of luxury internal debate. It's actually a bit more about how we um, tell a story overall. People overall are looking at the environmental impact of um, every, every brand and organization that touches their lives. If, if I may, I don't think you can diversify yourself away from the challenge we have in the current core business. And let's not forget that both our customers and us have a quite uh, a role to play. We have an installed base, we have uh, investments uh, done. So some companies might choose, as some, some of them are doing, to also on top of the advancing the LPG business, are uh, be active in other business. That's fine, but for me that's not to flee away or that does not mean that you don't have to fight to get it right for the role LPG can and should play in this uh, uh, transition. Otherwise, you just lean with the, the, the general debate, but that won't bring you any money and no prices. So for me, we, we should not just uh, try to be something but that we are not, while in the meanwhile, we would uh, not look after uh, our current and in installed base. Yeah, that's a good point. It's just a point of clarification uh, that I think... Um, I, I do agree that it's also about explaining the role of LPG within the overall energy transition. I fully agree about that, but I think we have to tell that story. I think that, that if we don't, then if you do, maybe it doesn't great build any sales. So I totally understand it's not the only, only thing that has to be done. But if we don't, then maybe you lose the license to operate and therefore the ability to sell your product. So I think it is critical that that story is told, but I do fully agree it has to be part of a story around the relevance of LPG today and for the future. And for me, I think a strong story area in that, because it's real and makes an impact on people's lives, is air quality. You know, that is something that links any part of the mar any market, any uh, use case for the product. I'll just add to that point. Uh, it's telling our story. I mean, I think the uh, electrification movement has done a fantastic job of telling their story. I mean, if you were the average consumer, you would think everything could be solar powered and run on electricity today. Uh, and that's just simply not the case. So we're having, I mean, I've, I've attended conferences where it's all about electrification, particularly in transportation, and you talk with the buyers, the fleet owners, and they can't find the vehicles that can meet their range, their duty cycle. So it, it's, it's, it's fun to talk about um, electric, electrification in the heavy duty sector, but the, the market's not there yet. So we certainly can take a play from their playbook and talk about forward thinking, what's available, what's the future, uh, as we uh, transition or migrate over to um, post-2030 goals. Sunil, do you, do you, what kind of competitors do you see in, in the space for, for LPG as a fuel and in the way that you're rolling it out and what are you doing about them? Is electrification also a, a competitor or, or, or an opportunity that you can yeah, partner with? So definitely, Sonia, if you look at it at the corporate level, I mean, there are two aspects to it. One is, am I trying to protect uh, the LPG business? Depending on my uh, corporate uh, ideology as to what interest I am doing, I, am I able to de-risk the core business of LPG? Uh, for Indian oil, I can share like today, uh, we've invested heavy amounts into, I mean, India would be one of the few countries who's migrating from a BS4 to BS6 in one go from uh, uh, April 2020. Now, if you see the emissions, uh, they, are, they are starkly improved, you know. Uh, so at the risk of, you, you know, losing my lesser cleaner fuels, but the company takes a stand. So competitors are within the system also, within the organization also, and of course in the external environment also. We are heavily invested into solar and wind powers. Today, all my bottling plants would have solar uh, power, this thing. Part of the load comes from the solar, this thing. Most of our petrol pumps today would have uh, solar paneling, even though they are small installations. It's an effort. So you are trying to, you know, de-risk one product against, you know, um, uh, protection from the competitives which the other product may be facing in the market. So you need to be well prepared for that. If you look at purely from the LPG point of view, yes, as I explained earlier, you need to optimize, you need to come up with new products. We've had cases of, uh, you know, replacing uh, the ship breaking, breaking industry 
replacing the acetylene with uh, an additive uh, distinct form of LPG. So you need to come up with such solutions. Recently, we've gone into industrial customers trying to give them a higher heating value and all. So there are ways and means of, you know, what the company really wants to pursue. Is it the product? Is it, is it the life cycle of the company itself? And de-risk according to the uh, external environment. Okay, thank you. Brahma, I wanted to come back to you on the, I guess if we come back to Europe, one of the earlier points that you made was you said you saw some potential for bio, well, I know we talk different terms, but L bio LPG, so LPG f as a, a byproduct of, uh, of renewable diesel production, but you saw even greater, or you see even greater potential in it as a, a product uh, of, of hydrogen. Um, and so my question is, uh, can you say a little bit more about why, because hydrogen can be turned into lots of things, so why, why LPG? And, and the, the background to that is how do you see the, from your perspective, what your customers want, what's the proposition of the LPG sector here in Europe to the European Green Deal that indeed is, is imminent from, from Brussels? And that all into one question. Well, uh, it connects up. Um, <laughs> no, ju just <laughs> maybe a point, point of nuance from my um, side. What is a bit awkward, uh, I think, to all of us, for decades running a downstream LPG company, the last thing you would really worry about that there would be not behind you supply, because the supply would come out of the refinery and you would ship it around the world, etc., etc. And we had a lot of uh, major and smaller oil companies to, uh, to provide that. Now suddenly, if you look uh, behind us, who's going to supply us with the renewable LPG, whether it's bio or uh, other flavors of it, uh, let's set that aside, then suddenly uh, there's far less or almost no uh, uh, people standing up, or uh, atypical. So uh, what I've seen, at least happening in our company, far more than normal, we have to involve ourselves uh, backwards in the chain to make sure, partly with money, partly with uh, offtake uh, guarantees, to make sure that these new players uh, are stimulated to evolve. And with all that effort, we have now uh, the grand total of two plants, one is operational and one is uh, uh, planned and committed in Europe. I need 20, I need 30 uh, in the end. So we, we have a, quite a battle as an industry to make sure we have the new generation suppliers of LPG, of the new LPG. So that, that's one uh, uh, quite important and quite mm -hmm. challenging uh, 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 driver. Then if it could have been 100% uh, uh, by LPG in our projections, that is technically not possible because you will run out of uh, feedstock. So that has nothing to do with mm. our, our preferences. That is just from a pragmatic point of view. And let's already start with the other alternative uh, pathways, uh, I would say. Uh. Then on a totally other note, we have the green deals uh, uh, th that maybe, uh, as mentioned this morning by the commissioner, that will come up from, uh, uh, from Europe, I think. The way we should address that is, again, be quite precise where we play, so don't make it too big. Uh, we have to stand for our customers and with our customers, uh, domestic and industrial and commercial, in the rural areas of Europe. Otherwise, they might become a victim of new policies that would make their life quite uh, uh, difficult uh, or expensive or a dangerous combination uh, of the mm -hmm. above. And there, I think, we can, uh, both with our current uh, product offering and with renewable, play role. I'll give you one example or two examples. In France, already today, you can only build have new built uh, installations with powered by LPG if it's by LPG. So that is, that is uh, not all the houses, but at least all the new built, that was already uh, regulation. That could be a way to step by step uh, uh, migrate. In Italy, that was uh, years ago, and I think it's an interesting story to be told here, uh, talking about that not all energy transition goes very smoothly. There was a very aggressive uh, a subsidy for biomass in Italy. So in a few years, suddenly, bang, there was a huge boom in, in biomass. And then suddenly, within four or five years, Italy suddenly had the biggest uh, air quality problem in Europe that they never had. Uh, and by the way, similar things happened, I think, also in GB and Ireland, where suddenly in every shed where nobody was ever was suddenly a biomass boiler because you had a, a subsidy uh, coming. So also we, there we could play a role in mm. bending that back to migrate from biomass and, and of course, still uh, uh, oil back to LPG, which should help to uh, deleverage mm -hmm. the air quality problem in parts of, uh, of Italy. Mm -hmm. Joe, and then we'll come and take some questions from the floor after that. But also this question of the, um, 
So it, it comes back to yeah, the, the future, the future of gas. And I think mm. everyone has said, I mean, it's on the one hand, uh, it's, it's the, the perfect transition fuel. On the other hand, it's also a destination fuel. But in the very long term, term it will need to be decarbonized for that, mm. for all its air quality merits, even the way it is. Uh, so this, all this talk of, of hydrogen and the potential, you know, where does this green gas mm. come from? How do you see that conversation? Uh, and I guess, again, the, the synergies between LPG uh, and natural gas, are you, I mean, is the innovation, the technology, the research, is that addressing both of those in parallel? Is this indeed also a, a future route for uh, LPG to serve rural areas and be fully carbon free as well as uh, air pollutant free, et cetera? Well, and uh, IGU, let me explain a little bit about the IGU. IGU is International Gas Union. Gas is a natural gas, mm -hmm. is a hydrogen, and uh, any gas, biogas, and renewable gas. The thing is that we have to look at the, the phenomena. The emission and the pollution is uh, quite different. Emission is a long-term solution, but the pollution is uh, urban air quality. Last uh, two decades, there is a linear relationship between the urbanization and the air quality deterioration. It really and the goes parallel. Then in such a, and the area, and the, look at the China and the India, they started uh, 2000. Uh, they uh, consumed the same amount of uh, natural gas. But uh, uh, 2018, China and, uh, increased six times, but uh, India is a little bit and uh, small. This is a really in the depend on the government the policy and the blue sky policy. So I think that's the way you look at the health issue is really in the imminent, you need the immediate action. So I think that's a climate change is something related to the emission and the urban air quality is something related to the pollution. Mm, yeah. So as a point perspective of IGU, we focus on the urban air quality. I mean, the Europe, is that, I mean, the population-wise, not that large compared to India and China. But the, I think Europe go forward. So we're going to get them all the case. We're going to follow the, that the standard. But the, we have to worry about the other country. They are suffering the energy poverty and the absolute poverty. So I, I think that's uh, our perspective of uh, natural gas is uh, the, we're going to, for a while, mm -hmm. the partner with the biogas or the renewable gas and the anything. But uh, in mm. the use of uh, natural gas is uh, power section, heating, and the industrial and the transportation. Next uh, and, uh, two decades, and we really focus on the transportation, maritime and the transportation, and the land transportation. Like and, uh, in our country, and uh, the large and the small cars and the truck, middle size of cars is run by and the diesel. That emits the lot and the micro dust. That's a deteriorate air quality. Mm. So we're going to switch around the, to the diesel, to the LPG. That is one of the solution. So we need some tailored designed solution, not the single formula works every yeah. area and every period. Yeah. So that's the my and the So in the, the global picture, it's a little bit what, what Stephen said, air quality is maybe the, the most unifying message mm. that works in the greatest number of areas. So in the global picture, the immediate priority, there's still a lot of... Um, well, immediate priority is to improve air quality, especially yes. in, in cities, mm -hmm. and that's where natural gas, so it doesn't need to be renewable for that, natural gas can still deliver a lot, still has a huge opportunity in terms of taking over from diesel, for example, or, or biomass. That's right. That's the, yeah, and then in the longer term, you say decarbonization, renewable gas, that, that will come, but mm -hmm. now we still have something else to do first. Yeah, yeah. The, the, okay. the infrastructure for the natural gas, uh, we can get is not the stranded asset. The biogas and the hydrogen gas mm -hmm. still you can use it, that infrastructure and okay. the new areas coming. Yeah, okay, Thank I you. think that's clear. Thank you, well, we can uh, carry on, but I wanted to ask whether there are any questions uh, from the floor. Yes, I can, it's very dark, but I can see a hand at the front here. If we could get a, we will try and get a microphone to you. Someone's running, so <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> here in the front row. If you could just tell us briefly who you are, that would be great. Great. Uh, my name is Suyash Gupta. I'm from India, uh, representing the Indian Auto Gas Coalition. My question is to Bram, uh, and uh, also uh, it would be great to get, uh, get a quick comment from jo uh, Joy on that. You mentioned about consumers, and we uh, 
Of course, the narrative, overall narrative in the last few years have drifted away significantly from consumers. And as a global industry, we have been, you know, uh, mostly it's about policy, it's about the narrative which has been uh, building up. As SHV, uh, and SHV is operating in multiple countries globally, and you've seen this transition happen at several places, wherein uh, maybe um, a couple of decades earlier, a consumer had more, uh, uh, a more, more control over its decision of the way, uh, the direction it needs to uh, take, whether it's auto gas, uh, whether it's LPG, or whether it's natural gas or electric. But uh, do you think in the, uh, in the days, where in this decade and the coming decade, wherein policy makers have, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the policy makers have a much higher say and they, uh, it's, it's about the mandates which are working in several countries. Okay, we go the natural gas way, we go the natural gas way. And uh, we go the electric vehicle way or EV way, uh, we go the EV way. And, uh, and is that uh, also, uh, how much of that do you think is coming from the media and the biased narratives uh, and the rhetorics uh, which influence uh, policy level decisions and do you think it's the uh, right way uh, for the industry to proceed? And Joy, for you, uh, my uh, related question is, uh, how much of uh, uh, influence of policy, of policy makers is it in the US uh, when it comes to uh, choice of fuels? Uh, thanks for the question, uh, which, because you bring me back uh, to the eating part. Uh, the problem with a sandwich is, and this is a different story from the elephant, the sandwich is uh, uh, in the end eaten in reality in one bite for all three layers. Mm -hmm. And we are in the middle. So the way uh, I see our role as one of the uh, players in the middle layer in the LPG industry is that although we have all these things happening uh, at the policy level that we don't get too, too much uh, distracted by that, we make sure we have the space to in the end make our business and do our investments in a direction of business that fits with the, the consumer. That means if we take uh, electric is that as far as I know, and I, got as I sit a bit on the distance, but if we today in India somebody would say, let's go uh, full electric for all the personal movement, that is for a lot of reasons not a very sensible way. And in the first place, even in Europe, they cannot afford an electric uh, car. And I don't think we can have everybody in India yet affording an electric car, apart from the availability and that the grid cannot manage it. So th that's how we try to select our solutions per market and our own speed. But then again, it's up to us all in this room to make this trade-off. Uh, when do I invest and, and go forward and where do I hear what is said, but say, guys, that is just not real, and I continue as I am. We are still growing in LPG as a company. We are still growing as an industry. We should not be ashamed of it. We should just understand how to explain why that is still a very good idea. Uh, and that can differ per uh, market. So I consider ourselves a bit the uh, sandwich integrator, but that's not always comfortable, because my example from China, where overnight we lost our total LPG business, of course, not something we're happy with, but then it is what it is, you move on, and uh, guess what? Since in China they push a lot also on industry, we have a, a lot of new customers going from coal and oil in industry to LPG, and sometimes even uh, LNG, believe it or not. Uh, so uh, you have to deal with that. And I think we have to try to balance, uh, to make the balance on behalf of the, c the consumer. And if the consumer likes it, that's up to the consumer. Uh, thanks. If I understand your question, you're asking how much control do we have over legislators and policy as at the association level? And how much also do the policymakers influence your business and influence your customers? Uh, so great. All right. Well, they sides. have a tremendous influence <laughs> on, uh, on how we operate our business, and, and they are certainly driving change. Um, that is uh, a key focus, uh, particularly in decarbonization. And I'd say we're, we're guilty, uh, someone, I'm glad Steve is here, we have not really been engaged in a PR campaign and, and um, uh, really getting the message out to consumers. And so with this void, we've allowed others to tell the energy story. Uh, and in, in our absence, we're now uh, in the crosshairs, if you will. I think propane we were seeing as kind of a niche fuel. We're a clean energy fuel. We don't really need to get involved in the fray of the energy discussion. Well, lo and behold, we're being sucked in. Uh, and, and in fact, our focus, a lot of decarbonization. So I would say d don't underestimate the power of the consumer. We just had a case, um, an instance where 
uh, a city in California was looking at um, basically disincentives for building with propane. We started a grassroots campaign. Um, uh, one of our members wrote an op-ed that was picked up by the local paper. And we were able to uh, uh, arguably um, influence that, that city and they have removed propane. Natural gas is still in this regulation, but they've removed propane because they truly see propane as part of the solution. Again, we were able to say we complement all of these other sustainability initiatives. So uh, don't estimate the role of having uh, a PR messaging, um, reaching out to your customers. I think that a lot of customers don't even know that there is discussion about removing their gas ranges. And by the way, in the US, we like our gas ranges. We like to cook with gas. So um, if, if we don't educate the public, what's going to happen is the first time they're going to hear about it is when they go to the Sears or the appliance store. I don't know if Sears is still around. And, and they go to purchase their gas range, and they're told that that's not available. You could only purchase electric. They have no idea. They weren't involved in the discussion. So it's our role to bring them in the discussion and also let them know the advantages of propane so that they are armed with the emissions benefits and the value mm -hmm. to shape the legislative discussion and the regulatory discussion. That's a very concrete example, yeah. Agree with the way you talk about the, the role of the industry within that, and I think being that connector between um, customers, between regulators, between politicians. So rather than seeing yourself as a sort of a, a victim that's kind of buffeted by these forces, but instead you have such kind of credibility as the knowledgeable experts in this space use that credibility to convene the different stakeholders, the customers, the stakeholders politicians, the regulator, to have a real debate about these issues and to highlight the role that you play within uh, that topic. So I, I really agree that that is, the, that is the way to think about it and it can sometimes feel very different, like you are trying to ride out a storm, but it, it does need to be more about playing a role within that. There are other questions. Yeah, it's a bit hard to see because it's, yes, I see a hand there. Hello. Okay. Oh, yeah. There's another hand. That's yeah. fine. Go ahead. Hello. Um, <coughs> Tell us who you are. Neil Murphy, UGI International. Uh, two questions, if I may. The first one for Stephen. Stephen, you mentioned that uh, from the analysis you did, the trust level for LPG was on the lower side, um, neutral to low. From the analysis of, of what you did, was it because that the uh, consumer didn't really understand and wasn't aware of what he actually had in the cylinder or the tank? Or was it mainly because he knew what he had in the tank and just didn't like what he understood? Um, so we look into the energy sector within that different fuel types and gas be being one of those. And um, we don't dive too much into the next level down what drives those um, behaviors. But what we do know is you have sort of a real spectrum from clean tech, which is driving this shift in the overall uh, perception of the energy industry, all the way through to nuclear, which has just been in the doldrums for over a decade in its reputation. And you see gas kind of gradually edging its way up. So what, what I think, but this is a um, more of a subjective comment, is that people, particularly in emerging markets, are seeing that there is a tangible benefit to gas. And it is to me, where I see hope that there is a better story to tell around um, this fuel type and the role it has to play, because you see in the markets where people touch it and it has a direct benefit, there is a stronger positive association and more trust with gas. In markets like uh, mo most of continental Europe, where people are not really so familiar with it and not thinking about it, you see less trust. So I think you can deduce from that that, yes, it is about not knowing what's going on and that more familiarity with the fuel will drive a higher level of trust. And that would, in general, be something we find across the research, irrespective of the uh, sector. Thank you. Yeah, there was one just down, yeah, over there. Hi, I'm Sophia Haywood. I'm from Liquid Gas UK. I've got a question for Joy, if I may. Um, I really resonate with the messages you were saying about the need for renewable or bio-LPG in the, the near future. Um, in the UK, we've got exactly the same pressures as you. So what would be your top two or three, if you want to squeeze another one in, asks for policymakers to help you get to where you need to be? 
So top three, let's start with number one, having a, an honest discussion about the emissions profile and the life cycle carbon footprint for all fuels. I think we're fundamentally arguing from uh, a, a, a point that's a, a disadvantage because policymakers, uh, and this might be, again, education, tend to look at uh, anything that's electrified as being, you know, 100% clean. And there is a carbon footprint associated with electrification, and we need to have an honest discussion about that. We need to talk about, uh, you know, the mining of the cobalt. We need to talk about what happens to the batteries after um, they, they need to be um, discarded. So, and when you take a look at that, then we can have a genuine discussion about life cycle of, of renewable propane. And in some instances, renewable propane, depending on the feedstock, is actually lower than uh, that of um, electricity. So I, I think that would be the first thing, to have an, an honest discussion in education um, with the policymakers. Uh, the next thing I would say is that's pretty critical is um, having a uniform message for consumers. And we're, we're looking at this with a coalition of partners. We partner with uh, diesel, natural gas, um, uh, ethanol, all types of various gaseous fuels, and really having the same talking points that we reiterate and they get amplified uh, in, in the newspaper, that get, it gets amplified in um, social media. I think it's really important that we have consistent messaging um, for the audience as well. Um, I, I guess the last the most important priority uh, that I see is uh, just making <laughs> renewable propane available. So, uh, you know, what type of investments do we need to, need to make? What type of legislation and incentives do we need to make early on? so that that becomes a reality. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of what they're doing in natural gas, because it's expensive for, uh, to produce renewable natural gas as well. Uh, and, and one uh, gas provider in Southern California, they're touting the value of natural gas, and if you are on board and you're willing, they'll give it to you, you're just gonna pay more for it. And there are a lot of Californians that want to do that. They are willing to pay more uh, to be able to just, if you look at electric vehicles, there are people that wanted to pay more for a Prius than they could have got a cheaper car because they are that committed to clean energy. So we need to find ways to commercialize renewable propane uh, in the next decade. Okay, yep. Actually, the microphone's ready. Hi, uh, my name's Alex Hedgebuteris. I'm with Dorian LPG, a shipping company. And my question's for Joe. Uh, the South Korean market has been pretty mature when it comes to LPG, and many of the younger generation have grown up with LPG in their lives, be it through auto gas or domestic usage. So my question is, what is the perception of LPG today, and how has that changed through the times, with a little bit of a focus on auto gas, but also as part of the broader energy mix? Thank you. Well, thank you for asking, and uh, I have to take an example of the Korea. The Korea studied the LPG as a gateway to the LNG. So at the time, and uh, it, you know, the LNG infrastructure needs a huge amount of money investment. You need the regasification because if you don't have uh, production on your land, you have to import in terms of uh, one is a pipeline natural gas, or the other one is a liquefaction LNG. So pipeline is a little bit cheaper than the compared to the LNG. Then and until you have a mature market, then we started uh, the LPG is a cooking fuel. Then and we go to transportation. Then it takes around 20 years. The since then and we invest a lot of money and um, put in the pipeline and for the so put in the storage to take and the LNG from the overseas. So it's just really taking time. I think that the LPG may be in the gateway to the immediate uh, the, the solution for the clean up your air. So emission is a little bit different approach. And uh, you know that, that as I said, uh, Europe is on, uh, already in the 40 years uh, coal power plant uh, that will be gone. And uh, uh, England said in uh, 2025 and the coal free, Germany in the 2029 is coal free. But the LPG is a really good starter to the, like uh, India is uh, really suffering and the biomass cooking to the woman, the health. Uh, then and that is uh, the, I think that LPG is uh, the critical element 
then so once you get used to it, the energy efficiency LPG, then you can move on to the, the LNG. So, so LPG is a gateway to, to, to developing an LNG market, yes, finally, uh, which requires much I bigger see that, infrastructure. I that, that advantage of yeah. the value of the LPG. Uh, I see we have another question. We're going to have to wrap up in a moment. Um, we'll take that one. Yes, we might have to make that our last one, unless someone else has already managed to get hold of a microphone. Yes, there as well. Okay, we'll make those our last two then. Yeah, go and, ahead. And good. My question is for you. So I'm Tucker Perkins. I'm from the <laughs> U.S. with the Propane Council. So we talked a lot about emotional arguments and about trust. We, Joy, I appreciate you finally coming to talk at least about a full analysis of the inputs of all the other solutions because we never talked about a full fuel cycle or the fact that some energies, biomass, for example, seems to be nuts to cut down trees, to burn them, to dirty your air, and somewhere along the line that's counted as clean. But the one thing, Joe mentioned it only once, and Sonia, I'd love to hear you say, when we talk about investment. So in the U.S., we would call it environmental equity. Um, I would argue that LPG offers a solution to change the emissions profile from cutting NOx perhaps 95 percent to cutting greenhouse gases 25 or 30 percent from the base load today, and we do it for zero investment. The, the investment that would be made is private. In order to achieve some of the other global initiatives, I see investments that well exceed in the U.S. alone $4 trillion. How do you rationalize uh, or how do we help us emotionalize our message when we begin to talk about environmental equity. We could do, we could clean the air significantly and allow that investment to be made to truly improve society. How, how does that resonate and, and come together to help us build trust? That's a question to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question, <laughs> luckily. Um, so how do, you, how do you sell a message of environmental equity? Um, I think it's, well, I would come back partly to what, what you said, what, what Joy also said. It's about um, being upfront and being honest, being credible about what you can and cannot do. Uh, so life cycle analysis, yes, I would say is a, is a good start. I think it's about uh, showing that you're aware of the, I guess, the big debates of today. So that would, I would agree with Steve that you need to be talking about decarbonization as well, even if that's not an immediate priority and even if that's not something you can deliver today or tomorrow. It's a big theme. Everyone's heard of it. We heard even in India, customers are, are asking for it. Um, so I think, yeah, so be upfront and honest about what you can and cannot do. Emphasize what you can do well. So delivering on air quality improvements, health improvements, emphasize that you can do so affordably. I mean, not especially here in Europe, but I think everywhere you see a polarization in the political debate, uh, the have, the have nots, as, as Sunil put it. So whilst there's a whole group of people excited about climate change and seemingly perhaps unaware of the cost implications and lifestyle changes, there's a whole other group of people which see things very differently. Um, as Bram said, also focusing on your, your core customers. If they're rural, well, they're going to be speaking maybe a different language, interested in different messages to the, uh, the well-off urbanites. Um, but nonetheless, then, I think, uh, yeah, keeping the bigger, longer-term picture in mind as well and demonstrating a willingness to engage. Uh, someone said being the, the integrator of the, or maybe it was Steve, saying you are a niche industry, uh, but that doesn't mean you have to be yet uh, buffeted by all of these big things going on. You can also reach out and be part of the, uh, I guess, the, the, the smaller, the niche industry that brings other people together, that demonstrates an awareness of the bigger picture and plays a part towards, well, moving the world to that. Uh, yeah, that would be my, my suggestion. Something about intergenerational equity. Yeah, that's a good point. And so yeah. we shouldn't sacrifice clean air for the kids today um, under these aspirational goals for how clean the air potentially can be tomorrow. We have an obligation to our children right now, today, and propane provides an opportunity to provide clean air for that population. Yeah. And our final question there. I hope I answered it. If not, come to me after. <laughs> um, Neil Murphy, UGI. Um, so the second question I had was this. For anybody on the panel who wants to take this one, um, in terms of the next 10 to 20 years, we've talked about legislation being such that 
very, very low carbon allowance in certain uh, geographies, such as California is one. Does anybody on the panel actually believe that the affordability issue we will not be able to address in the 20 years? Does anybody believe on the panel, uh, as uh, Bram mentioned, that the availability issue we will, not to be, we will not be able to address that either? And if that's a belief in the next 10 to 20 years, any comments on how you see society adjusting to this lack of affordability and lack of availability? Okay. I don't want to jump in. So <laughs> let's okay, let's I'll give everyone first. a chance. This will be our <laughs> wrap up then. Everyone gets a chance to respond to that's an even bigger question. What are we going to do when it's not affordable, it's not available? Um, give us a, a final thought and please, yeah, be brief. So, so I think the affordability issue will be there for perennial times. We, we faced it even uh, at times when customers uh, are having the product. You see spikes in Saudi CP and all, and the consumption levels come down. So it's not that s customers stop cooking, but it does happen, whether it's the you know, reduced consumption or optimized consumption and all. But I do believe that ultimately it's bouquet of fuels and choices that is available to the customer at that point of time, since you mentioned a 20 year time frame. I mean, what choice does the customer have? A common customer would be guided basically by availability and affordability, leave aside the environmental goals and all, it's a harsh reality. So what solutions we as the you know, product providers offer to the customer? At that point of time, I think that is vital. And that's what I can say. Is fair enough. Uh, so I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, affordability certainly will be an issue. I, I, uh, environmentalists will argue that it, it, it's we're looking at um, devastating the devastating impact of climate change. So certainly, it's worth paying more. In California, we typically have far-reaching regulation and legislation. And when it misses the mark, they ratchet it back and then hope to kind of reset the goalposts. So we've seen that in many instances, and I could see that potentially happening uh, as well in this, this case. In terms of availability, I'll just give you a headline that I, I came across a couple days ago. The largest uh, public utility for electricity um, shared that they will not have enough backup electricity to meet California's demand in uh, two years. Uh, and this is because the electric utility also has mandates, this is something we should be aware of, they have mandates to be cleaner as well. So California's electricity is being produced by uh, natural gas. They have mandates to produce it from renewable natural gas by set dates. And since they will not have enough backup power, we're now looking at the state importing electricity from other states that possibly produce that electricity from coal. So you can see the, the irony here um, of what happens with mandates when mandates go wrong. So th there's going to be some adjustments, but uh, certainly the in intention and uh, direction should be for the cleanest option uh, that we can offer. Good question, Neil. Um, the short version of my answer is that, as I mentioned in the top layer of my sandwich, one of the rules of the game is to win the next elections. So I'm not so worried that in the long run the affordability issue will not be corrected and balanced at that level. Then to the availability issue, I don't want to think too much about that because it's not in our interest as an industry to <laughs> think we will not be able to do that because then our problem will be even bigger than the elephant that we started with. So for me, the availability issue is something really from our entrepreneurial spirit as a business to, uh, to drive. And I go with uh, Joy that uh, the good news is that in all the other energy solutions, their availability dilemmas are not smaller than ours. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure that we are a bit smart and, and, and push it forward and uh, not have the availability issue uh, that you refer to. That's a good point. John? Well, and uh, to be energy sources, uh, you have the right three criteria and the sustainability nowadays. And uh, second is affordability and the energy security. So once you put it in the, your energy resources in your social plane, it is a should be sustainable. 
So I think the affordability is a little bit different from the availability, economic-wise and the quantity-wise. So I think this affordability is uh, one of uh, cri uh, three criteria of uh, energy trilemma. So we call the energy trilemma is uh, exactly the energy security, sustainability, and affordability. So I think the uh, affordability is more or less than the, uh, when you uh, get the, some the bio propane and the bio things, the hydrogen, the, what the cost? We can afford it. So that is a real issue. So this is not a simple issue. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we have to approach it from the well to the wheel approach, life cycle approach. Then and then we can find uh, what is the complementary, uh, the compelling solution at this era. Yeah. Finally, Steve. Um, yes, yeah, so I've talked a lot about um, how to get uh, people to trust this industry, but I guess my answer to that question is also around trusting the people. Um, to have the um, confidence to communicate that these dilemmas, that there are challenges, that it, it is not a perfect world and we don't have a ready-made and immediate solution for every uh, part of the transition, but this is how we believe this particular fuel will pay, play this particular role. So to have an open and honest dialogue and a dialogue where we also share the struggles and the things that we're working on is uh, how I would address that challenge. Okay, thank you very much. And a big round of applause to our whole panel. <laughs>